It's originally a lab for electronic musical instruments, including microphones. Um, Stein is maybe the oldest media lab in the world. We've, we've been around since 1969. Uh, we started in, in, in a world where electronica was invented. We first had um, machines or devices that could make electronic signals. And you, when, when you send those signals to loudspeakers, you actually get a sound, which is strange. It was the first time in history that we were able to make sounds that didn't come from anywhere and not from a physical object. So it's, you know, it's very relevant to what, uh, what we just heard from Eric. This whole idea of virtuality. First, you know, it was almost like the first instance of virtual sound. You know, somebody did not beat on something or, you know, hit something or touch something in some kind of way. No, there was sound coming from nowhere, from a loudspeaker. So uh, Stein was founded by a bunch of composers that said, well, this is strange, you know, this, this, it, even though it comes from nowhere, but still, you know, we have to be able to play it. And so Stein stands for Studio for Electro Instrumental Music. The focus has always been on musical instruments. How do you actually play these sounds? Uh, it's, it's, and, you know, over the years, this whole movement has been relatively successful and relatively not. It's, it is kind of strange that, that if, you, if you look at a music store and you look at synthesizers that you can buy, most of them will have a piano keyboard. And there is really no logical reason for having a piano, key, a piano keyboard be the main interface to this electronic world. And so that's, that's sort of the concept of Stein, and um, we're still doing that. Actually, it's, it, you know, the, the whole issue is actually still relevant. Uh, these days, you know, instead of, in the old days, in the 60s, you would go to a concert and look at a tape recorder. Literally, you would see a tape playing and you would listen to the tape, which is, of course, incredibly boring because there's nothing to look at. And a musician that has at least some kind of device or interface that, that, that they play with is theatrically a more interesting experience. And this is still the case. I mean, you, you must have all seen laptop musicians. Most of them are just as boring to watch as a tape recorder. You know, they're just like standing there. The laptop is doing stuff. You have no idea what they are doing. They're probably checking their email while, you know, they're playing a sound file. And uh, so the whole issue of, well, how do you perform electronic music live is still uh, relevant in a way. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about pretty much what I think is the next step. And it has a lot to do with the previous discussion, the hybrid spaces that Eric mentioned. Uh, that are indeed very real. And I, you know, I, I've called my lecture at the end of music as we know it because I think we've made huge mistakes in the 20th century when it comes to music and you know, the relationship uh, between music and its outside world, the, you know, our society or whatever. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about the differences between music and visual arts and how we've come to a point in music that we're basically stuck. You know, if, if you, if you talk to some composers, they will literally say, well, we're out of notes. In the Netherlands, the note is up. We've done it all. And how to, you know, the way to move forward is to step out of the classical frames of music. And that's what, that's, I'd, that's what I'd like to talk about. And so I've sort of talked about this. This is time. What we do is people work with us. Um, Stein doesn't do a lot of research ourselves. We, we work a lot with the people who come to us to do their work. So we have a guest house, we have residencies, we coach people, we teach all kinds of courses and workshops. Go to our website, stime.org, and you'll see. We work very closely here in The Hague with uh, the Royal Conservatory, also at, with the Utrecht School of the Arts. And anyway, you know, there's lots of places that we collaborate with. This is all not very interesting. This is what I'd like to talk about. Um, If you look at many different art forms, but also music, its production and its reproduction has, of course, like all the other art forms, has very strongly shaped what we've done with music. And <coughs> I'd like to outline some of the more technical con uh, contexts for music, and, and then, I'd move, then I'd like to move to more, the more conceptual uh, aspects of that. Of course, it all began with live performance, people playing an instrument or even you know, singing. 
or drumming on hitting, hitting something and making rhythmic sounds. That was, of course, those were the first forms of music. And then we started composing for performance. You had you know, chamber orchestras and, and, and symphony orchestras. And then you know, beginning of the 20th century, we started recording those performances. So then we had recorded music. But, uh, and, and you had the first, first instances of the distribution of the recorded music. Album, 78 RPM records. And then there was radio, which was another way to distribute recorded music. And so we could play back at home. And you know, at, at, in, in, during the 20th century, we got accustomed to buying LPs and singles uh, in, in order to play those on our record players. And then there was the Walkman and the CD. And now there's the MP3 player. But, uh, and, and, and those are all media that, that are sort of, that present music to us. We either go to it, uh, to a performance, or we listen to some kind of recording or some kind of construct. And some of the new technologies are like things like GPS, which is interesting, because right? um, you know, this, this is a normal iPhone, but you know, this, this thing holds my music, but it also knows where I am. That's an interesting combination. Uh, augmented reality, like layers of information on top of the real world, the kinds of things that, that Eric was talking about. So, but now let me outline for a little bit what I think is the problem with music, or you will probably have seen it too. Uh, I always ask this question to people, what's on your MP3 player? I did this, you're, you're kind of a big audience, so it doesn't make sense to ask all of you. Um, but the answer that most people give to this question is uh, sort of everything. Uh, most people have a lot of stuff on their MP3 players. Of course, it depends a bit on how big your storage is on your, on your player. Um, but what's, what's different these days from you know, the old days is that you can have a lot of stuff on your MP3 player. You can have like you know, tons of genres. And you know, it's not just the quantity also, but more, I, I, you know, I know more and more people who are not in their taste, who are not confined to a specific genre. Whereas when I grew up, when I was a teenager, and I, when I was in my 20s, pretty much everybody I knew was like into one or two or maybe three genres of music that defined your identity. And these days, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. It, 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 and it's strange because, and it, to a degree, this is because it's all there. It, there's easy access to all this music, to our, our entire past of music. We can just find it, put it on our players, and listen to it. And you know, we may even not realize anymore how special this is. When I, when I was in my 20s, I, you know, somebody at some point said to me, oh, you know, there's this great thing called musique concrète. It was a movement in, in, in classical experimental music in the 20th century, where composers were using real sounds, recorded sounds from the world to make music with. And I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. And it took me three weeks to actually find a recording to hear you know, what music concrète sounded like. I ended up in some local library in Utrecht, which was the big public library that had a lot of records. And I found out that they had a Varese record. Edgar Varese was one of the composers in, in, that, in that genre. But you know, it, somebody else had it, so I had to wait another two weeks. But then it, it was returned, and I could borrow the record, and, and I could listen to music concrète. These days, you know, I'll, if, if I mention it, if it, I have Shazam on my phone, and I have all this, all these, with Shazam, I can just hold it up, and, you know, and it, it will listen to any piece of music, and it will tell me what it is, and I can buy it three seconds later. And any, you type in anything in Google or, or, or Spotify, or you know, it doesn't matter. It's all there. And it makes a big difference in how we relate to music and, and to how, how we use it for our own identity. And so it's even marketed that way. And this is a, an advertisement for the biggest iPod. It holds everything. That's the point. So what happens, and this is, this is, there's many charts like this, uh, but this is, like a, this is a typical image of music in the 20th century, where pretty much things are linear. 
one thing leads to another, leads to another. I think your brand, you know, specific genres split up. Uh, there's, there's folk rock becoming country rock and soft rock and soft soul and pop soul and all of that. The, the point of this chart is that it's these linear developments of genres and that things are ordered in time, that they make sense. One thing causes another. The point is, that's not there anymore. Um, I think Amy Winehouse was elected artist of the decade, of the first decade of the 21st century. Amy Winehouse was the artist of the decade, which I, you know, I like. I think Amy Winehouse is pretty good at what she does. But it's kind of strange to have an artist of the decade be somebody who does a very old genre, soul, very well. And the same thing happened again last year. Uh, Michael Kiwanuka, does anybody know Michael Kiwanuka? He's a you know, young English guy, I think he's 23 or something. But he as well, he's a soul artist. And he's like, it's very good. Think of all the good soul music you've heard and put it into one person, you have Michael Kiwanuka. And he, in England, he was voted artist of the year 2011. That is weird. Uh, whereas we used to sort of look for innovation and, and, and people who push boundaries. Now we really appreciate, apparently, these artists that don't go for progress, but some deep, for, for like a deepening of, of, of existing genres. And there's, there's something that illustrates this very nicely. Oh, wait a minute. Go to Safari here. This is a, an interactive visualization of, as you can see, the evolution of Western dance music. And you'll see, you'll see the, the slider going from 1800 all the way to 2000. It comes from a site, it comes from a travel site. It's called How Music Travels. And so this, this site is about the relationship between music and space. And so it's got these continents. And there's the USA, there's Jamaica, Africa, Europe, with the UK and Germany. But, and most of it, you know, it's sort of, you know, you, you get it. It starts in Africa, then we have Jamaica, and it, you know, it, it, this all lasts a long time. But like, this is a century. Huh? Then the whole blues and jazz thing starts in New Orleans in, in, in America. And still, this is very sort of, you know, American-based. The old dance music came from there in the 40s and 50s. Soul, blues, disco. But disco is something we understand in Europe, see? <laughs> we have synthesized, because we, we, we understand synthesizers better than the, than the, than the Americans. Uh, and we're here, we're at uh, 1980 now. And this is where all the real stuff happens. There's a crazy explosion of new genres. This is like at, 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 you know, at the height of music development. But look, look at this. The last decade, since the year 2000, we have dubstep. <laughs> That's it. And I don't know how many of you know dubstep. Well, you know, in, in the 90s here, we had uh, jungle. Dubstep is not that different from jungle. This is strange, isn't it? Suddenly, all development stopped like 10, 10, 15 years ago. There are no new genres. Or there are so many new genres that we have no names for them. I'm not saying there is no new music anymore. And you know, I know many people, even more than ever before, are making music. But my point is, there is not this linear progression of things causing other things anymore. That the way the genres are structured looks more like this, just like stuff, names. And there are some relationships, but you know, before you know it, you'll have somebody who combines, or a band that combines rock and roll with electro and metalcore, whatever, you know. It's thinkable, and probably somebody's already doing it. Occupy 3. <laughs> Good. Good. Oh yeah? Okay, here, here we go, Occupy 3. 
or uh, ska mixed with funk rock and uh, intelligent dance music up, up right there, IDM, intelligent dance music. So the, my point is that the structure has just gone. It's one big pool, network, C, unstructured, chaotic mess of stuff, of genres. And um, so progress is, is we, we've lost the whole idea of progress. And <laughs> I'd, like to take, I'd like to take one step back now and, and look at a very important difference between the way um, the visual arts have developed in the 20th century and music has developed in the 20th century. And here, this is another reason why I think music has a problem. Somewhere around the, you know, the, the 20th century was all about modernism, modernity. I had the idea that, that as long as we think, we can grow, we can become better at things, we can control things. You know, we use science to, to understand the world and then we can control it. And, and in Dutch, we have the term de maakbare samenleving. We can design and make the world that we want and we will happy. We'll, we'll be happy in it. It's very, also all very utopian. Uh, but the central thing about modernity is the role of thinking. Uh, at some point, there was the Enlightenment versus Romanticism. That was even before the 20th century. And basically, the Enlightenment won. We want to be rational rather than dirty and emotional and, 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 and messy. And what that did to visual arts, somewhere in the middle of the 20th century, visual arts started looking out, outward. All the visual, not all, but you know, many, many <coughs> visual art forms really started looking at society, at the world, at financial systems and commenting on it. You know, so the, the, the whole classic traditional visual art world really connected itself with everything around it, basically, to a point that you know, we have now artists like Tinkerbell who are publishing books with emails that they got. And we, which, you know, I don't know if you know the book Dearest Tinkerbell. She got all these angry emails from all these people that didn't like the fact that she used her cat. And she basically, together with a lawyer, they went as far as they could in finding out who those people were that were sending her that hate mail. And they just basically, basically published everything they could find, Scre you know, screenshots of all the websites and, and the emails of these people in this book. But this is, you know, what the hell is this? It's like art in the legal system. It's because she did work with a lawyer. It was a legal statement. This is not visual art anymore in the classical sense. It's really, you know, a huge commentary on the role, you know, on things like privacy, things like, you know, in like, like politeness and, 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 and the whole, the way we, we communicate with each other. And the point of, the, of her work is not what it looks like. I don't know if you know the project, The Suicide Machine, that was done by Warm, Stichting Warm. It's basically an, an online thing where you can input your identities of LinkedIn and Facebook and all these, these social media sites and g give it your names and your passwords on these sites and it will go to these sites and it will perform suicide for you. It will slowly erase all your profiles and you can see this. You'll see it logging in and it deletes one picture and the next picture and the next picture and the next picture. It deletes one friend, another friend, all your friends. You can sort of watch your life, you know, falling apart, your, your, your virtual life. Beautiful. You know. But the beauty is not in the visuals, of course. The beauty is in the concept. The beauty, you know, it, it's visual arts really connecting to the outside world. The problem is music did exactly the opposite, which, you know, I think is a shame. Music has turned inwards enormously. What modernism did to music was like ignite a total, especially in the, in the classical world, in, in the world of classical music, a total obsession with form. Rationality was applied to the inner workings of the piece. We had serialism, which was like, you know, a new theory about how to structure notes. And we had people like John Cage that said, you know, music is also silence and it's, you know, there's chance and there's randomness, and, but it was all, it's all about the inner structure of the musical piece. So it's almost like a total denial of the world around it. Even, you know, I've even drawn the, the arrows from the outside world into music because that's what musique concrète was. Musique concrète is, is an interesting example of where you actually, you take sounds from the real world, but you then use them for their sonic properties, not because, of, because they mean something, but you know, 
oh, this train is a really interesting sound. It's rhythmical. And you use its musical properties. And so, and basically, now music is stuck. It's done that. It's done pretty much everything thinkable. And it's done. You know, the note is an op. We've done it all. And the only way out, uh, and, so, and the main problem with this is that when we think of music, and this is especially true for conservatories that aren't called conservatories for nothing, they are very conservative. They conserve the two traditional ways of thinking about music, namely the autonomous piece, the artwork that is composed by a composer, and the live performance. And so though, you know, those are basically the two ways that the, the music world thinks about music. Whereas everybody else has been doing other stuff. You know, we have, I mean, dance music is of course a good example. Dance music is at least, you know, appealing, and this, we've done this for, for centuries in music, but you know, at least it takes the body seriously. It's not just, you know, some amazing mindfuck, but it's, you know, something that, that, that makes you move. Right? So, I saw a clip recently that was what somebody said was talking about funk music and what they said was funk makes your legs and hips move in ways that you can't practice which I think is a cool quote and a cool definition of funk but um, the rest of the world and we've seen music for theater and film and opera of course is a very old example of this and then in the 70s and 80s primarily and 90s we got this thing like music for music for computer games and I can remember that this was a new thing for music students. I was teaching at the Utrecht School of the Arts at their music and technology department in the early 90s. And even the music students there, who are quite you know, open to new technologies, were very interested in music for computer games because, and you know, one student once told me, you know, it's 8-bit, you know, it sounds awful. I don't want to compose for that. Because at the time, most music consoles like the PlayStation were 8-bit you know, not too good sounding pieces of technology. But that, all that has changed. You know, it, and it's a very, a game is a very interesting and different context for, the, for, you know, for composing music. Because people are in some kind of section of the game, you have no idea how long they're gonna be there, but yet they do need background music. But at the, and at the same time, they're doing things. So you want the music to sort of stimulate me to do stuff, even though you don't know how long it's gonna take and you don't know what I'm gonna do. So the composition of music for a game is really, you know, a completely different kind of manipulation of musical structure than the classical autonomous piece that has, you know, a beginning and an, a middle and an end. And there's installation art, and now there's sound art, and there are audio tours. These are all new conceptual contexts for music that I think are more interesting than, and, you know, than, than, than the classical ones the piece and the performance. And of course, you know, and even at time I see you know, many people, because we are all into performance, but frankly, I see a lot of musicians coming to time that are doing things that I've seen other musicians do 10 years ago and even 20 and even 30 years ago. And they still think, well, I'm being very innovative. Yeah, well, you know, they're doing it for the first time, but it's not, it's not innovating the concept of music or you know, any kind of way. People that are doing installation art or sound art. Sound art is at this moment a more interesting venue than music itself because we've always defined music so narrowly that, you know, we've basically we, music has sort of painted itself into a corner. Oh, and where do we go now? Well, there is nowhere to go, you know. And um, I, was, I was talking to a guy from um, a music technology course in England somewhere in the UK. And he was like, oh, you know, pff, art schools these days have sound art curriculums. Ha! Huh. And he was being very sort of derogatory about this. And then I said, well, you know, why do you think that is? Art schools are experimenting with sound in new ways. They, 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 they have like installation art and all kinds of new contexts for sound that you guys in conservatories have always, you know, kept out of the door. He said, well, that's not real music because you have been so anal about what you think music is, other people have gone on and started doing cool stuff. 
And now the real innovation is not happening, happening in the conservatories, but in all these other places. So, um, and this is how I want to end my talk. Um, Olaf just walked back in. Olaf is from Two Days Art and I'm from Stein, but Stein also works together with Two Days Art and we have plans to start a new initiative here in The Hague, which is called THX, THX, The Hague Exchange. We would like to see people experiment with this kind of stuff, uh, to use these new technologies such as GPS or, 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 or augmented reality or anything else that enable us to, 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 to use physical space as a new context for sound and music. And the fact that you have devices that know where you are is an incredibly challenging notion for anybody who wants to work with sound or music. And depending on how I move, I can, I can hear different sounds on, on my headphones. Uh, so, so you, know, and, you know, this is like an official call for residency. If any of you are interested in these kinds of projects, <coughs> contact Olaf, Olaf at todaysart.nl, or me, dickatstein.nl. Uh, and, it, you know, well, most of you will probably live in so, you know, the ability to stay at time is maybe not so, 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 so thrilling, but um, we'd like to coach you, you know, today's art and time together in these, mu in these projects that are about music, music, new music, or music, maybe the, we shouldn't use the word music anymore either, I don't care, uh, but new sonic applications for these complex spaces, you know, how do you design music or soundscapes for a city, like a giant, a whole city, or something that lasts five weeks, or something that is 400 kilometers long, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the real innovation in music is not going to come from the classical piece or performance thinking. It comes from you know, thinking in terms of hybrid spaces. And parts of, a part of this, these hybrid spaces, as Eric was talking about, is that you know, they're partly real, but there's you know, stuff to enrich the, re the, the, real spa the real space, the real place. And that can be music or sound or anything. That's where the real innovation is going to come from. And there's not a whole lot out there yet. So there's a lot of territory to be discovered. If you have any good ideas, please, you know, let us know. And you can work with us and we can present it next year or any time at Today's Art or it's time or, you know, there'll be lots of places or venues to present it. Thanks.